All right. Well, good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I'll be your host for today. Those who might be new to Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, we're all about bringing science, adventure, exploration, and conservation live into classrooms across North America and beyond. So with the school year now in full swing, we're hosting 30, 40, even 50 live events a month with scientists, explorers, adventurers, and conservationists from all over the world. So many of you tuning in right now are familiar with the Darwin 200. So we've had a couple events with them over the last couple of months, or sorry, over the last month as they've circumnavigated uh, the United Kingdom in the tall ship, the Pelican of London. So we connected with them on the Isle of Lewis in Scotland. And then we had an absolutely incredible event live from Bass Rock uh, with 150,000 gannets. Uh, it was loud, uh, from what I hear it was smelly, but uh, it was absolutely incredible to be able to broadcast that live now. So this amazing journey circumnavigating uh, the UK was uh, kind of a pilot mission for the, the bigger Darwin 200 in 2021, following uh, Charles Darwin's epic voyage in the Beagle, stopping in 50 ports. Uh, it's gonna be quite an adventure. We're gonna learn all about that in just uh, a moment. Um, along the way, they were looking at the health of the waters in the UK. They had a team of scientists and videographers on board. Uh, I'll share the website later so you can see uh, some of the amazing video content that they created. So they have finished their journey. They've arrived back in London, sailed under Tower Bridge. They are now docked the Pelican of London, a Canary Wharf, and we have a really cool event in store for today. So I'm gonna introduce now Stuart McPherson. Stuart's an explorer, uh, he's a biologist, and really spearheaded uh, this expedition. So let me bring him in live. Uh, hey, Stuart. Hello. Hello, everyone. It's lovely to join you. I'm with my good friend, Dr. Rowan Holt, who is the marine biologist and chief diver on the Darwin 200 ship as you sailed around the UK's waters. Yeah, hi, everybody. Nice to meet everybody. Yes. So uh, it was lovely to speak to you last week from Bass Rock amongst all the hundreds and thousands of squawking gannets. It's slightly less, less noisy here in London, um, although we are all around all the bankers and, and all the central business districts. So it's a little bit of a contrast from Bass Rock and, and all the wildlife that we've been seeing. But we're absolutely honored and privileged today to be joined by Sarah Darwin, who is Charles Darwin's great, great granddaughter. And she's a, a very kind and wonderful supporter of the Darwin 200 project. And it's an absolute honor to have her here um, uh, to, to, to speak briefly to us today. So a massive, massive thank you to Sarah for joining us. Wonderful. Well, it's an absolute honor for me to be invited. I'm so excited to see your ship, see see you on board your ship. It's absolutely wonderful. Oh, absolutely. Well, thank you. So all things being well, we're going to start the Global Voyage next year, over two years, sailing right way around the, the world. The goal, the goal is to then beam out live throughout the entire voyage from really exciting, exotic gen, um, destinations to engage with, with schools right the way around the world. So with, with, with wonderful exploring by the sea to your plant, pants. Hopefully the next two years are gonna be a very, very exciting time for all of us ahead. Absolutely, Stu. So I have a video queued up, a cool little intro that you sent me earlier about the Darwin. Why don't we run that and we can dive into a little, a little more of the voyage and talk to Sarah. That'd be great, thanks. All right. Darwin 200 is a planetary conservation initiative. Next year, we are going to begin a voyage around the world following Charles Darwin's journey on his ship, HMS Beagle. Our mission is to help create a brighter future for our planet. We're going to train the world's top young conservation leaders and create the world's most exciting classroom by beaming out interactive experiments, activities and resources to schools across the globe to engage millions of students during every single day of our voyage. Our goal is to inspire passion for science and conservation. This year we're undertaking a voyage around the United Kingdom to test our systems and get ready for next year's global adventure. We are halfway through our seven-week voyage around the UK. We've sailed along the coasts of England, Wales and Northern Ireland, and we're now amongst the beautiful Isles of Scotland. During our journey, 
we've undertaken studies of dolphins, whales, birds and seals. Our dive team is surveying UK waters and has already found colourful kookaburras, anemones, jellyfish and cup coral. The data we collect is going to several recording schemes for conservation studies. We have brought on a team of young scientists in partnership with the University of Plymouth. They are studying a range of subjects including pollution, macroplastics, microplastics, planktons and many wildlife studies. We're creating videos about our adventures and launching them every few days during our journey so you can take part in our adventure. Visit darwin200.com for details. All right, so that gives a nice kind of little taste, I think, of some of the, the adventure and some of the things you saw along the way. Uh, I'm gonna tuck myself behind the scenes now, Stu, and I'll come back in uh, for a little live Q&A action. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much for that, that introduction, Joe. It's a pleasure again to speak. Um, and Sarah, we, we obviously, everyone is, is very interested in your wonderful work. What sparked your passion for nature and science and conservation and your and your work as a botanist well i think actually as often happens quite quite a simple thing in fact um when i was uh, a, a child um my mother came into uh, my brothers and my room very early one autumn uh, autumn morning and said come on let's go mushroom hunting so we kind of got out of bed it was it was probably around this time of year september and uh, it was still quite dark and we got out of bed and we went and collected mushrooms um, uh, around near our house. And uh, interestingly, m both my brother and I both say that that was, uh, funnily enough, a, a really pivotal moment in uh, both of our interests of nature and wildlife and pursuing conservation. That's that's wonderful. That's that's so, such an interesting start to it all. That that's absolutely wonderful. I notice you have a a bust of your of your illustrious great great grandfather yeah. to your right behind you. I'm sure he would. I, I know, of course, he studied fungi and mushrooms in, in in great detail, and so I'm sure he would have very much approved of those beginnings. Yeah. <laughs> that's wonderful. Um, of course, I'm, I'm aware you you've spent a lot of time in the Galapagos as well and done some incredible research and your PhD out there. Um, I've never been to the Galapagos myself yet. What is it like and, and what was the wildlife that you saw like? What was your favorite animal? Or how did you find it? Well, I mean, when um, one of the times I went there, uh, we actually arrived by ship, which is, I guess, what you will do. And uh, <laughs> that, that is just an incredible, because you're constantly looking on the horizon when will I see the, the first cloud that will indicate that we're arriving at the Galapagos? You know, because it's wow. about a thousand kilometers off the coast of Ecuador. So this arriving in Galapagos, as Darwin did, uh, you know, uh, watching the, uh, the great islands emerge from the um, horizon line was just absolutely incredible. And I'm sure you will love that as well, as will your viewers. So that's, that was very exciting. And of course, you know, Galapagos is just the most extraordinary place. It's uh, famous, of course, because the animals show no fear of humans. So you can literally walk up to them and they will come up to you. Um, and that is, uh, is an extraordinary experience since we're always in the UK, we're always, you know, having to keep really, really quiet to see a sparrow or a squirrel or something. But in Galapagos, they literally, they just sort of seem to ignore you. 
Um, wow. The giant tortoises, of course, I think um, I've got one here to show oh. you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've got all the paraphernalia here. Um, <laughs> they are, they're, they're the size of a coffee table, um, a, a large coffee table. So they really are quite astounding. And they sort of look, well, they are prehistoric um, and they look prehistoric. And when you approach them, um, sometimes they kind of sit back on their... Uh, sit back on their legs and they'll pull their head in and as they pull their head in they have to sort of empty their lungs so they do this extraordinary hissing sound um and they are the most amazing creatures and of course they actually eat and disperse my um my phd subject which was galapagos tomatoes so the uh, great the great uh, tortoises actually eat the tomatoes and disperse them um, so they were sort of part, if you like, of my interest while I was studying. That's such an interesting, I, I didn't appreciate that. I didn't realize they were the distribution vector. That, that's yeah. really amazing. D did you find different tortoises have different diets on different islands? Or do they? Well, I, I was really doing the, the botany. I did a little bit of uh, analysis of pollination, um, yeah. but I didn't actually... Um, Actually, I mean, other people have uh, analysed, you know, the tortoise, the tomato seeds that go through the gut. I think they take around a month to go through. But of course, the abrasive action that takes place with the seed actually helps the tomatoes germinate. Anybody at home who might have a, a pet tortoise will know that if you feed um, your tortoise tomatoes, uh, you'll find little seedlings of uh, tomatoes popping up where your tortoise has pooped. Um, so they're, 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 they provide wonderful fertilizer, they disperse, and also they have this abrasive action on the seed which actually help it germinate. That's absolutely fascinating. I, I honestly didn't realize that. That's absolutely fascinating. Growing around sewage farms in yes. the UK. Yeah, if you yeah. look around absolutely. sewage farms. Tomato yeah. plants do very well. Yeah. They, they certainly do. And in fact, I understand, Rowan, you'd probably be able to tell us more, but they're actually used as an indicator, aren't they? Yes, I that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I heard yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's, that's so interesting. Were, were the giant tortoises your favourite that your favorite animal out oh. in the Galapagos? Oh. Favourite is, that oh, that is, I mean, there is so much to choose from. I think the flightless cormorant, so uh, those those are very cool. Um, so they they really look like a normal cormorant, a, you know, a large black black bird with a with a long black neck. Um, but when you see them uh, standing on a rock, they'll dry their wings, and you suddenly see they have these little vestigial wings. Um, wow. And uh, so they really have a they have lost the ability to fly, which has improved their ability to swim through the water. Because the interesting thing about Galapagos is that for an adult bird like um, the, the the cormorant, there's there's actually no uh, predator, so they don't need to to fly off if that makes sense. Um, so there was no need to expend all that energy uh, with feathers that would allow them to fly. Um, it's more efficient to have something that will allow them to 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 swim efficiently. Yes, yeah. Do they have much bigger feet in that case as well than compared to that, normal cormorants? That's a very good question. I have no idea. That's a, <laughs> there you go. That's a fun, fun little yeah. research project. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, oh, that's that's really interesting. Well, we, we we thoroughly, thoroughly look forward to visiting on the Darwin 200 voyage and beaming live, and, and we'll join you, of course, um, from Galapagos. We have to, of course. And, yeah, um, no, that would be we'll wonderful. Try, yeah. That would be incredible, absolutely. Or perhaps you, perhaps we can we can organise for you to come out or something like that, and we can see them together. That would be a, a wonderful, wonderful lecture for exploring by the seat of your pants. That'd be great. It must have been an amazing and very, I presume, emotional um, moment for you personally, seeing the islands and, and reflecting on your great great grandfather's voyage. What, what, what was it yeah. like for you seeing that? Well, and actually, it was quite funny. So I went on a a, a trip with my uh, one of my brothers and um, my parents and we went on a boat trip in the Galapagos and our guide was a lovely um, Ecuadorian guide yeah. and um, he kept on saying you know when Charlie was here such and oh. such happened and Charlie said this and Charlie wrote that and 
And eventually we were all a bit bemused because we were clearly supposed to know who this Charlie was. And um, so my mother said, you know, could you possibly tell us who is this Charlie? You know, and, and the guy just sort of looked at us, he couldn't believe it. He said, well, of course it's Charles Darwin. Um, and uh, none of us had ever really referred to Charles Darwin. You know, we tend to call him either Darwin or Charles Darwin. But, um, you know, they were calling him Charlie in the Galapagos, which was, uh, which was very cool. Wow. <laughs> that must have been a very interesting moment. Yeah. I, I, yeah, you, you don't associate that name or, or Chuck. You wouldn't really say Chuck yeah, Darwin. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, that must have been a, yeah, a funny moment for you. Yeah. Um, are there any any moments from the Beagle Voyage that, that you are most excited um, about us recreating in the Darwin 200 voyage when we when we follow Charles Darwin's journey on the Beagle, or, or any other elements in addition to the Galapagos uh, that, that you're excited about? Well, I must say, I think um, as uh, as you as you know, and uh, your viewers probably don't know, I was lucky enough uh, around 11 years ago to do a, a similar voyage um, to you. I didn't spend so much time on the, on the ship, um, but we made uh, episodes for television for the VPRO, which is the Dutch equivalent of the BBC. And um, one of the places that we went to that uh, I have to say, I wasn't not looking forward to going there, but I just, it wasn't high on my list, was Tyrrell del Fuego, right at the tip of South America. And I arrived there and was absolutely bowled over by this pristine, beautiful, wonderful landscape. I mean, it was absolutely breathtaking. And as I wandered through the forest in Tierra del Fuego, I, for the first time in my life, I realized that something was missing. Um, and I don't know whether anybody can see whether they can guess what I thought was missing. Perhaps we can have that as a question later. Uh, I think I might have a, an idea, but I, I won't say anything. <laughs> I won't see if any of the students listening. So it, did everyone hear that question clearly? Students listening in classrooms, what do you think the answer to Sarah's question is? What was missing in Tierra del Fuego since Charles Darwin visited? Let's yeah. see at the end. Let's see if anyone can work out what it might be. Yeah, I think absolutely. A sneaky feeling. It it does look very, very, very beautiful, and I, I bet I bet it must have been an adventure exploring um, exploring the, the beautiful canals down there. Did you see Mount yeah. Darwin named after your ancestor? Yeah, we did. And actually, if you look uh, look over my shoulder there, you can see um, a copy of one of the uh, paintings that was done in Tierra del Fuego. Um, wow. And that that shows uh, the mountain range. It's a, it's not so easy to see. Um, it, it's yeah. uh, it's a little bit old this picture, but it was incredibly moving. Um, it was incredibly important for Darwin and his theory, uh, Tierra del Fuego, and it was incredibly beautiful. And I was very very lucky to have met uh, one of the very last uh, Yagan uh, Indian people who who are from originally from this part of the country and uh, spend a bit of time actually we looked at plants together which was uh, which was a wonderful um activity oh, that's amazing that's, that's well, i have a little a little boat here i have another little prop um oh. so the, the so tyrell del fuego uh, is the translated into english it's the land of fire and um these people who lived there used to they were semi nomadic and they would travel around by little boats that looked looked like this. And this was actually made by uh, Christina Calderon's son. Uh, and Christina was the was the last Yagan Indian, uh, pure, pure Yagan Indian in Tierra del Fuego. And um, what is so incredible is that the people who lived there used to um, carry fire with them uh, everywhere because they, they didn't have clothes. So they um, needed to keep warm. So being semi-nomadic, they would put the fire into the bottom of the boat, and they would actually carry it around with them. Hence the name, uh, the land of the fire. That's that's incredible. That's wonderful. I, I remember reading in the Voyage of the Beagle, Darwin describing the lights on the cliffs and and as they as they journeyed round in the land of fire. So um so thank you. That that's wonderful to see. That's really really wonderful. Um, I mean that you raise a very good point. People think only of or often own mainly associate Galapagos with, with um, 
with with Charles Darwin's voyage. But of course, as you write, as you as you of course you pointed out, there were so many locations he undertook such fascinating um, jobs, such fascinating research and work in. I, I, I've been very lucky to go to the Falklands, and I, I know he spent twice as much time in the Falklands as the Galapagos, and did some very, very interesting, very rudimentary work that, 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 that I mean, that developed some of the rudimentary ideas that led on to the theory of evolution in the Galapagos as well, before even getting, sorry, in the Falklands as well, before getting yeah. to the Galapagos. So, yeah, it's a very good point. He had been to so many extraordinary places. We've had yes, a question. I think, um, sorry. Yes. Oh yeah. I, mean, I was just going to say, I think another really important place for Darwin was actually the Atlantic forest. So this yes. is the the tropical rainforest that you find down the Atlantic close, coast yeah. of, uh, of Brazil, um, because he really experienced probably the first time, you know, real biodiversity, you know, this, this, this area teeming with wow. life. Um, you know, and and I think he had, you know, one of these sort of psychologists probably call them like a peak experience where he sort of ran out of words to describe the emotions that he felt seeing all these extraordinary butterflies, smelling all the tropical flowers and listening to wow. all the birds and insects. Wow. <laughs> I, 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 that's a lovely way to say it, a, a peak experience. We're we're, um, we're conscious that a lot of the Atlantic forest has, has sadly been destroyed since Darwin's visit. So one of our goals is to plant a thousand trees, um, at least a thousand, ho hopefully considerably more, but to help in a small way to start to restore restore and work with some of the wonderful conservationists in Brazil um, yeah. undertaking this important work. So yeah, it's, it's it's wonderful that some pockets have survived, and anything we can do to help to help expand it and help restore these beautiful Atlantic forests yeah. to, to, to replenish that biodiversity that-, that Well, that's, that that's absolutely statistic. wonderful that you're doing that. And as you say, there are a lot of uh, very, very committed uh, yes. conservationists in Brazil uh, planting up uh, the forest. And um, and actually I planted a tree in, in the Atlantic forest as well, so. That's all wonderful. Well, we've got yeah, quite a few- Yeah, it was a wonderful, wonderful ah. experience, yeah. I bet. I see we have quite a few questions coming through. Oh, I, I know you're, you're very busy. Um, yeah. Uh, should I hand over to Joe to, to field the questions? All right. <clears throat> I will pop back in. Sarah, that was awesome. It's great to hear some of those stories. Um, I visited the Galapagos in 2016 and got to swim a couple of times with the flightless cormorants. And oh, their eyes, you? those blue eyes are just, I'll never forget how blue their eyes are. Um, wow. Pretty incredible. And they're their, their back legs, they're big and meaty and just powerful for coming through the water. It's pretty cool. Very good, excellent. All right, well, let's start grabbing uh, a few questions. So I'm gonna go to uh, Mr. Armstrong's group. He's got grade sixes, grade sevens, and grade eights joining him today. So I'm gonna bring him into the call. And Mr. Armstrong, if you have a question queued up from one of the students, we'd love to steal one. Yeah, you can go right ahead with those questions. Anthony asked what the favorite part of your job is. Oh, Michelle asked how, okay. elaborated on how long you got started. You mentioned the uh, mushroom hunting and wondered if the, like there you must not have just jumped into the work as it is now, but how long uh, since you've been doing the work in your field? Gosh, two, two lovely questions. So, well, the first one, um, what does my work involve now? Actually, I work, uh, if you can believe it, I work on birds now. Uh, so it's a little bit different. And I'm interested at the moment in um, the relationship between humans and nature. So I collect stories that people share with me about uh, experiences that they've had uh, when, they, when they listen to birds. Um, so, for example, my mushroom story would have been, uh, you know, an example of a, an experience that people have with everyday nature that surrounds them. And I look at those stories and, and I'm interested in relating to people uh, with, with nature in a slightly different way than, than just being a scientist. And the other question, what was the other question? <laughs> Remind me. Oh, yes. How did I move from, from mushroom hunting? Onto, um, onto biology studying. Well, as you quite rightly uh, established, I was probably about 10 at the time, and um, I grew plants for, for many years. But in fact, uh, when I left school, I actually went and studied art. 
which has been incredibly useful. So I do botanical um, paintings. Um, and then I got into botany because of botanical paintings. And then I studied the plants in the Galapagos. Um, and since then, I've really been working more on this relationship between humans and nature. All right, very cool. So that class is joining us, grades six, seven, and eight uh, in Hanover, Ontario. So here in Canada, uh, I've got a second class joining us here, Mrs. Carrero's uh, class. Let me bring uh, her into the call. So Mrs. Carrero, when you're ready, we'd love to steal some questions. And you have Woodville uh, listed as a location. Uh, where is that? Oh, Mrs. Carrero, uh, we can't hear you. We had you before, but the mic doesn't. Let have... me now. Ah, gotcha. Okay, so we, sorry, I'm I'm going in between my students and you guys. So, you know, we're all learning at the same time. So um, we're in California, we're in the Central Valley in the very middle. We uh, basically we're known for um, supplying all the fruits and vegetables across the United States. So, yeah. I'm looking to see if I have any students that have any questions. Mine are kind of quiet today, this group. So I'll just wait for them. Okay, well, I will come back in and we'll challenge them to pop in a couple questions for us for the next awesome. time that I check back in. Thank you. All right. Yeah, no worries. So we've got a question here that came in online. This is from Thomas. And Thomas is wondering, you know, evolution is such a, such a hugely important concept. Do you think there's anything, a concept in biology as important left to be discovered? Wow. Uh, well, that is, that is a good question. Um, let's have a think. Do I think there's anything waiting to be discovered? Oh, well, yes, of course, but um, who knows what it is? Because I think uh, a lot of, lot of times with, with scientific discoveries, um, you know, you have to have an, an initial idea, if you like. So Darwin, when he was researching into his origin of species, he had an idea, but then he was looking to try and find the process of speciation, trying to work out how it actually happened. So... I'm absolutely sure there will be lots of exciting questions still out there uh, for all you young scientists to aspire to in the future. All right, Stu, I'm going to put you on the hot spot here. We have another question. Uh, where did the concept uh, for this come from? Not only uh, like a pilot voyage around the UK, which is big enough, but to undertake something as large as the Darwin 200. Well, um, it's been 10 years of work. So it's been 10 years of developing the idea in, in serious work, two years. And we have been incredibly fortunate to work with some really wonderful partners. And the goal is to try and energize and bring together young people to help um, get kids away from the computer screens and into the, into the wild parts of the world to get their hands grubby and, and re-engage with science and conservation. As you, as you may know from our previous lectures, we're trying to create the world's top young 200 conservationists and make the um, make the world's most exciting classroom with activities, experiments, competitions, citizen science research projects every single day of our two year voyage and weekly lectures as well. So honestly, where did it come from? Um, it, it came from a, a simple, simple idea about engaging young people and hopefully engaging millions and millions of people around the world to care for our planet, to love the amazing nature that we've got and cherish what we still have. Because conservation is about what we still have. It's not about doom and gloom. It's about caring for what we still have and, and, and creating a better future for our world. So all of those things. All right. And I've got a diving question here. So I think we have the perfect person to answer it queued up. Uh, okay. <laughs> Uh, how many dives did you get to do uh, during the journey? And did you have a compressor on board? Yes, we did have a compressor on board. I was also using uh, a rebreather as well as part of the diving, which uh, allows us to stay underwater for a long time. Uh, we did around about uh, a dive per week. So it was, wasn't that many, but it's uh, a rare treat to get um, so many dives done in so many different places that are very, very different from each other as we went around the UK. So we were down in the southeast, then southwest, then up through into Scotland, and the far north, and then far northeast. So it's a real sort of big ge biogeographical variation between everything that we've seen. So, yeah, not that many, but very interesting all the same. And in really remote places, some really remote locations as well. 
So that was good, really exciting. Yeah, that must have been a highlight. And then I assume you were dry, uh, diving with a, a dry suit. I think the waters are a little chillier. I, yes, I, I always dive in a dry suit because I don't like cold water. But Stuart was a lot braver than me and had a really thin wet suit on. But uh, yes, we, we usually dive in a, in a dry suit, which keeps us nice and warm. I, I've right. got to be honest, I started to regret not listening to Rowan. He's much more intelligent, much, much more knowledgeable than I am. And the waters of Scotland were certainly quite chilly after an hour or two in the water. So to be honest, yeah, have to, have to learn from the expert here next time and really follow his advice. <laughs> it was really quite chilly. <laughs> Sounds like Canadian diving. It's always cold here. I still dive wet though here in Canada. Um, okay. I don't find I get it in the water, but when I get out and the wind hits me, then, uh, yeah, then uh, I yes. realize yeah, yeah. what I've done. Yeah, very <laughs> cool. Uh, Mr. Armstrong, I can see you've got another question teed up, so I'll bring you back in uh, to go ahead and ask that question. Yes, yeah, students were asking about the favorite uh, parts of your work, and in particular, Aaron asked what the biggest tortoise was you have ever seen. Oh, wow, the biggest tortoise. <laughs> well, it's kind of like that big. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm I'm uh, I'm not very good at. Uh, I can tell you the smallest tortoise I've ever seen was that size. So they have um, they have a breeding. Uh, uh, they have a research station on one of the islands in the Galapagos on Santa Cruz, and um, they actually captive breed tortoises there, um, and in order to let them go into the wild again. Um, and so I've seen tortoises that are that size. Um, but of course, it takes like, I don't know, 80 maybe years for them to get to the enormous size that they are. And um, I don't know, I'm, I'm sort of guessing over a meter, probably. Wow. That's a, that's a big tortoise. Very, yeah. very, 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 uh, very. All right. Mrs. Carrero, I think they've got a question teed up in California. So I have to again. Um, yes, one of my students asked, um, her name is Bonnie, and she said, uh, is there anything about your job you don't like? Oh, Even though it's an amazing job. Hi, Hi Bonnie. Yeah, that's a really good question. What I don't like, I don't like paperwork. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, I love doing my work. I love everything about it. But sitting down and having to do the, the sort of the bits of paperwork, that, that's not my, not my favorite thing. But, you know, you have to take every job has its... Uh, has its uh, good bits and bad bits, and you have to you have to end up by doing all of those bits. All right, fair enough. So Stu, you're a biologist as well, done a lot of exploration, uh, discovered some cool new species of carnivorous plants. Uh, I imagine you would probably feel the same way, writing papers and things like that isn't always fun. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I, I spent year, I've spent about 10 years climbing mountains and living in a tent basically in, in the rain, often on, on misty mountains in Asia, um, often having just a can or two of tuna a day. So I remember, I remember, oh, I, I loved every moment, of course, but I do remember coming down from those mountains and, uh, and having massive meals and feasts when I came down. So I guess for me, sometimes the food in really, really remote places may, maybe isn't the absolute best, but the experiences and the memories and, and yeah, the, the discoveries and the adventure that you have as I'm sure Sarah will, will testify, makes it all well worthwhile. So um, so for you young guys listening at schools around the world, um, don't think adventure and discovery is in the past. Sarah's proven as well. Um, there's wonderful, wonderful research you can undertake all the way around the world to discover and, and make incredible findings. So all of you young ones watching at schools around the world, yeah, we really hope you go into a career of science and conservation and help us, all of us, appreciate more the, the beauty of nature around our planet. Yeah, and I think there's one thing, one sort of uh, a message that I get from Darwin loud and clear was that before he left the UK, he was incredibly familiar with his own nature in the UK. He knew the insects, he knew the beetles, he knew the plants, he knew the geology. And what was so important about that was that when he arrived finally, you know, in this fantastic tropical forest in Brazil, he therefore knew that what he was looking at was different. So I would say that there is wonderful nature all over the world. But in order to appreciate how wonderful it is, it's really helpful if you know what's in your backyard, 
what's in your back garden, what's in your local pond, or if you live on the coast, what's in the ocean. Um, and you start by learning, you know, just what's on your doorstep. And then, and then, uh, then you know what is different about what you see elsewhere. That's a really good point. That's a really, really good point. I wonder if any of the students have worked out the answer to Sarah's question from earlier. Has anyone out there had an idea what could be missing in the forests of Tierra del Fuego? Okay, so uh, those who are tuning in live with us, you can use YouTube if you wanna try and pop in, or sorry, the chat sidebar if you wanna try and pop something in there for us. And then uh, Mrs. Crow's class, Mr. Armstrong's class, uh, just shoot me a message in the chat if they put any predictions in for us, if they can kind of take a little guess at what maybe they didn't see there. While we wait for that, though, I did get a new question in uh, via YouTube. Um, wondering about, you know, are there any or da dangers or risks involved in, in you know, work in the field or sailing, you know, around the UK or around the world? Is that for Stuart or for me or for Roan? Why don't we do both? We can we well, can jump to you both. Why don't you start, Sarah? Um, well, of course, there's always dangers, uh, but there's dangers in your kitchen as well. So, um, uh, yeah, doing field work, you know, you have to be very careful uh, when I'm sure and Stuart and Roan are doing their field work. You have lists, you you check your equipment, um, you make sure that you, you go through various protocols so that you know that uh, you're at least... Uh, trying to minimize those risks. Uh, but of course, there are always risks. Yeah, I, I, I of course, echo that too. Um, going around the UK and the, the, our tour ship, we've had to be very careful. Um, we've been taking young scientists as well, in some of which had never even been on a, on a boat before. Um, they had to climb up in the rigging all the way up to the mast, up to the top of the mast, um, clipping on with safety harnesses, all the way up, but it just goes to show that if you're careful, you can absolutely do things safely and have incredible experiences. And many of them watched, for example, dolphins skimming across the surface of the water around our ship, flocks and flocks of birds flying through uh, past the vessel and obviously re reaching out um, to all the islands that we've been passing. So even though there can be dangers, if, you, if you're sensible and take it seriously, you can, you can also overcome those, those dangers um, with, with sensible thought and precautions and um, have some incredible experiences. Um, yeah. And you can start young as well. If you want to learn to do something like learn to dive or to snorkel, then start young, um, get your training done, progress you know, steadily through different levels of training. And, and then you'll find that uh, you, know, you can minimize your risks by being you know familiar with the situations that you put yourself in things like that you know a bit of training will actually stand you in good stead as you as you go forward into a, a job and later life yeah that's that's a good point yeah that's true so get out there into the field and go exploring all of you all of you young ones at school get out there and see nature in its real sense out in the world it's the best way you can go and appreciate it all right absolutely um let's check in and see uh with our two classrooms just to see if anybody had any predictions for what was missing so we'll check in with mr armstrong uh did they send any predictions in mr armstrong or did we stop? no they're actually they're they're trying to search it up on the internet to find it <laughs> that's cheating yeah <laughs> all right as yet but they're asking what is it tell us okay. <laughs> Let's check just to check with Mrs. Carrero. And I know you have another good question there too, Mrs. Carrero. So I'll bring you back in. Any predictions, Prediction. any guesses? Um, something that there's no fire there anymore. I saw that. So I that's that was the response. I was, didn't know if they understood the question. <laughs> All right, well, fair enough. Shall I, shall I tell you or should we wait a little longer? Uh, I say let's reveal it. Let's reveal it. Okay, reveal. So walking in the forest of Tyrol del Fuego, I could nearly hear the echo of the footprints of the native people who used to live there. But sadly, uh, when I was there, there were no people living um, in, in their forests. I, I'm glad to say that things have changed that uh, land now is being assigned back to the local people. 
Um, and while I was there, there was a, a home being built um, in a beautiful, beautiful bay. So with any luck, maybe there will be people walking through the forest again, because what what struck me, I mean, very often one sort of looks, you, you sort of think about conservation, oh, well, it's all the human's fault, you know, I wish there weren't humans in this place, but actually humans have a wonderful, wonderful um, gift of being in nature, and I fully support people spending time in nature, and, and here I was in a place where the humans were so missing from that landscape and that place that it was so obvious. Um, so absolutely, get out there, uh, go and explore and uh, see what you can find. Go and lift up a few stones and see what you find underneath and uh, get out there. Absolutely, yeah. Great advice. If, if, if I can end on one story on that note, which I particularly love, and I hope, I hope Sarah won't mind me sharing this from her wonderful ancestor, but Charles Darwin, I believe while he was at Cambridge, before he began the voyage, the voyage Sarah might, might correct me on this, but I, I believe it was before he even went on the voyage of the Beagle. Um, he, he, he loved beetles and he turned over a log and found one beetle. So picked that one up with his hand, he turned over another log and, and found another beetle. So picked the other one up with his other hand. But then and he, a third beetle, which was even rarer, scurried out from the log. So he grabbed that one, put that one in his mouth, but unfortunately that one bit his tongue. And so it bit <laughs> his tongue, spat that one out and dropped the other two from his hands and all three scurried away. <laughs> so that just shows you what a wonderful explorer and naturalist um, and how enthusiastic um, he, he must have been. So, um, so yeah, I really hope everyone listening to this has enjoyed our, our time with Sarah and um, will get out there and explore and have adventures for themselves. Yeah, absolutely. So Stu, as we're getting uh, close to wrapping up, I'm just wondering, are you able to go mobile and just kind of give us a view on deck before we, oh. we log off today? With pleasure, if, 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 yeah, absolutely, with pleasure. <laughs> to be honest, it's been a little bit rainy and gray, so you're not seeing it, it's absolute best. We're inside the ship. She's currently being reprovisioned, so there's supplies, uh, tons of supplies, all over the ship at the moment. But yeah, of course, with pleasure. Rowan is very oh, kind. Oh, Rowan's going to be cameraman. Okay? Yeah, so I'm, I'm up, yeah, you can see up my nose. <laughs> all right, road trip. There yeah. we go, there all we go. Right. Yeah, so we'll take you out um, outside and a quick walk ar around on the deck so you can see the masts and the sort of shape of the ship. Here we go. Yeah, I can see you're tucked right in the, the downtown there on Canary Wharf. Yeah, we've got Canary Wharf all around us here again. Yeah, let's go. Let's go. <laughs> Right, here's the ship there she is the pelican of london absolutely and if the children can look carefully you'll see a little thing ahead of the pelican right come over on this side set up the mic seven seven weeks we've been sailing past islands and beautiful wildlife and now we're in the concrete jungle of london this is the, the banking area yeah, yeah it looks so a little bit different from some of the remote areas we connected from yeah, it's very yeah. just, there's no yeah. gannets here no gannets no. No. we'll walk down the ship to 45 meters long um there's a course about 45 feet long around that length but she had over 60 people on. So she was shorter and more people. We're, we're 45 meters with about 45 people on. Um, she has three decks um, in front, uh, on top. This is the stern, and she has three masts. And if you angle the camera, you'll be able to see all up there, and those are the three masts. And the young scientists will climb all the way to the top tops and look for wildlife and look for birds and explore and see the incredible landscapes. So, um, so yeah, a little... Oh, okay. There we go. There's the see, the see the back of the... There's the stern, the Pelican of London. Very cool. Yeah. 
we run up to the stern? Have we got time? All right, so it looks like we're going to head and check out one more part before we, we log off for today. Very cool. Okay. Stu, we just, we just can't hear you. I think you're a little far from the mic. Oh, she's beautiful, isn't she? Yeah, it's pretty. Yeah. You don't see a lot of ships like that anymore. Sorry, it's a little bit windy here. Um, sorry about that. If you, if you couldn't hear, okay. I'll just yeah, turn all the way up. That's up there in the rigging. And so um, if, if people can imagine, all of the sailors and all of our young scientists have to climb up the rigging behind us here. And it's not as scary as it looks. It's a bit like a ladder. So you have to climb up these ropes here to set the sails. Go right the way up to the yards. And so that's what they've been up to for the last, last yeah. seven weeks. Right the way up yeah. there. Okay. So I hope that's a nice little overview of our ship and right. um, what we've been up to. Very cool. Well, what what a journey and an even bigger one to come. Stu, thanks so much for taking us uh, into that journey, taking us on the Pelican. Sarah, thank you so much for joining us today and and sharing some stories with us and uh, and memories. It was it was an absolute blast to host uh, both of you today, um, and we're looking forward to more adventures from the Pelican. A massive thank you to Sarah because I know how busy she is. So oh, well, thank you so, so much for joining us. We all really appreciate it. Well, thank you so much, Stuart and Joe. This is and oh, Roan. Hi there, Roan. This is absolutely wonderful to have a look around the ship and to talk to you guys. And, and very, very best of luck with the next steps. Thank you, thank you, thank you very, much. very much. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's lovely to see you all. All right. Thank you so much, everybody. Stuart, Roan, Sarah. Amazing. Thank you. Uh, Thanks. Take care, everyone. Have a lovely day. Uh, cheers. Thanks. Bye.